Let's have a look at the problem on page 275. Um, this is the stochastic version of the basic neoclassical gross model in which we have the one period return function in this form. No surprise. Um, first of all, we need the feasibility set. This is a gamma xz given by this open interval. Um, it cannot be closed. The interval cannot be closed because uh, if any time, if any time this was the case, then it led to L and zero, which uh, which makes no sense. So uh, in some detail, the feasible we can get the feasibility set if we if we if we consider the limits of the investment decision. The the lower bound is zero. Uh, in this case, there is no uh, capital stock next period. And, and the upper bound, so lower bound is zero, upper bound is this formula. Uh, in this case, consumption is minimal. Uh, at the lower bound, consumption is, is maximal. So we have this correspondence. We have this correspondence. We need to show that uh, the two prerequisites of theorem 9.12 hold, um, assumption 9.1 and assumption uh, 9.2, and we all, we need also we we, know, we need to check that uh, condition A and condition B uh, of uh, theorem 9.12 also hold. So. Let's do this in turn. Assumption 9.1, uh, gamma is non-empty. Yes, it holds. Because gamma, this is non-empty. It's an easy feat. Um, Demonstrating or showing that uh, assumption 9.2 also holds uh, is, is, a, is a bit more difficult. Um, it's obvious that part A of assumption 9.2 doesn't hold. Uh, F, one period return function F, because it's a logarithmic function, uh, it may take on either uh, sign. So we need to play on condition B of the assumption. So we need to show the integrability uh, and that the limit uh, holds. So uh, we need to play on condition B of assumption 9.2. Uh, so we need to, okay, just check where we are. Um, we need to show the integrability and the limit. Okay, so um, we need to find uh, a bound, an upper bound for the one period return function. This is consumption in period T between output and investment. Uh, given this, This is the one period return function. Uh, we know that uh, that this inequality hold this inequality hold so next period uh, capital stock cannot be higher than the output this period. So 
uh, one of the consequences of this inequality because of the monotonicity of the logarithm so this leads to this inequality leads to this inequality uh, by the use of the monotonicity of the function of the of the logarithmic function which is equal to this okay uh, this is true of uh, every t so we can say just a few examples um, it is true It is also true and the like. So in general, we can say that uh, it also holds. All right. Um, okay. Um, this leads us to the to the recursion uh, because just one example. Okay. So. is true but we can use instead of this part the following so we can establish a recursive structure is equal the last line is equal to this line which is very nice because uh, uh, we have a uh, we have the recursion, what we are looking for. Everything can be traced back to the initial value of the endogenous state, x, 0, and the history, and the shock history. Okay, so this is, this is why uh, recursive structures are so useful. In general, In general, we can say the following. So now we are trying to put this last line into a general formula, recursive formula. Hopefully I won't screw it up. Uh, the next T is not higher than some yes Z N yeah it's it's fine I I think it's fine um, and taking taking uh, into account the fact that uh, 
xt is described by a plan, we can say, and this is uh, in equality 3 from the textbook, we can say that the following inequality holds. All right, so uh, we have formula three from the textbook and let's proceed to four uh, from the textbook. We know that this equality applies. This is an equality. X, Y, Z, which is equal to this function. Okay, we, we know this for sure. Okay, uh, given that uh, Y in period T uh, is higher than or equal to zero, the next inequality also holds. All right. So we have the following inequality, and this is inequality four from the textbook. In which we used what we have just established. Okay, um, all right, um, future shocks uh, should be taken into account on expected value, which is known and finite and fixed. So uh, taken all this together, it means that F, the one period, return function uh, has an upper bound. So we have an upper bound for the one period return function uh, f. Okay, so this is the one period return function and we have an upper bound uh, for the one period return function. All right, so uh, let's proceed to uh, inequality six from the textbook. Um, we know that we have a policy function. Okay, from this we know that it is true. It is also true. So this is this is a way, the way to uh, another recursion in logarithmic in logarithmic forms we can say um using the recursion
we see the same, everything can be traced back to the initial value of the endogenous state and the shock history. This is great. So, um, in general, we can say about the policy in logarithmic forms it's going to be very useful soon you will see uh, I mean that we have uh, the logarithmic form of the policy So we have this uh, formula leading to 6 of the textbook. All right, I guess it's it's nice. So, uh, in chapter four, we follow the strategy to find uh, the one period return function and upper bound. Um, we, we, we don't need to revise what we did in chapter four. Uh, the only thing we need to do is, is that we can do the same in the stochastic version uh, of the problem. So uh, on page 94, it was uh, equation four, or inequality, I don't remember. Uh, it was an inequality because it was an upper bound. So we are looking for the analogy of, uh, uh, of uh, um, expression four on page 94. Um, so, what we are interested is uh, a bound for the one period return function. It's no big deal, I promise. Okay, which is, which cannot be higher than this expression. No, yes. Okay, and putting all this together, we have an upper bound for the one period return function in every t. All right, so this is the stochastic analogy of the bound four on page 94 uh, of the textbook from which um, we can find an upper bound for uh, the value function. Um, the value function is uh, 
the discounted sum of the one period return function in the subsequent periods in this way. So what we are looking for is an upper bound for the value function. We can go to infinity. Okay, here we use the upper bound this upper bound. So we are using this upper bound in every period. We need to be cautious because it's possible to screw it up, trust me. Okay, so we are putting the bound, the upper bound we have just defined into the parts of this infinite sum. Yes, and let's have one more row in period T. This is what we have as the upper bound. can goes to infinity. Uh, this infinite sum is equal to the following. No, 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 no. We have a multiplication here. Uh, it's easy to say that this part is equal to this sum. Infinite sum of infinite sums. This is what we have. line infinite sum of infinite sums yes and a great description of what we are doing okay and Okay, and putting all this together, we have the following.
this part, this final part, is familiar to you. This is the analogy of the formula uh, on page 94 uh, of the textbook. Uh, this, with this formula, we have an upper bound for the value function. Uh, shocks, this is pre-given, the shocks can be taken into account, should be taken into account on expected value, which is known and stable and finite. So we have an upper bound for the value function. On this ground, we arrive at exercise 9.11. Uh, here, still talking about the same problem, we have an optimum policy function. We have already used this optimum policy function. Um, we need to check uh, the conditions of theorem 9.12. So, according to condition A, um, with this value function, we have, we do have this value function. Um, with this value function, we need to uh, abide by the limit restriction. So, what we need to show, what we are supposed to show, is this limit. This is the value function in general. We will specify it right away. And the integral is with respect to this common probability, uh, common probability measure. Okay. Uh, to simplify things, let's grab this part of this limit, and let's work with the value function in separation. This can be rewritten. in this way. So this is the concrete form of the value function. Which is the same as the value function with the plan in it. Okay, and it's time for us to apply the policy function. final part. Okay, this is two. So the next step is to put what we have into the limit and to check what we have. So t goes to infinity and we have on the basis of what we have covered we have the following formula. Yeah. 
Yes. and the probability measure. Okay. Um, the shocks should be taken into account on expected value. So we can drop the integral and uh, replace the individual shocks with their expected values. Which is finite and known and stable. This is an infinite sum, and we can make good use of this fact. Yes, we close this bracket, and there is one final item in the end. Okay. So everything is finite here, so uh, the limit must be zero. So we can say that uh, condition A of CRM 9.12 uh, holds. Um, we need to check condition B of the same theorem, theorem 9.12. 9 so um, it's... Uh, it requires another, a, a, a different this, uh, approach. So, two, uh, equation two of the textbook here is this limit. is supposed to be zero. Uh, what does it mean in the case of the stochastic growth model where we have the value function in this form?
what does it mean? Uh, we need to put the plan into the value function. As a result, we will have the following limit. and the probability measure with respect to which we do the integral. Okay, uh, this limit has three parts. This is one, this is uh, two, and this is three. Let's see them, let's have a look at them uh, separately. Um, integration means that we need to take the shocks uh, into account on their expected value, which is again known and given and fixed. This is m for every t. Uh, so let's uh, try to say something about something intelligent about the three parts. Um, Let's see part three. Let's check the limit. Let's check the limit of part three. This is the same as saying which is zero because m the expected value of the shock the logarithmic shock is finite so the, the limit of the third part is zero uh, it is also true takes no integral to say that the limit of the first part is also zero. So we have the second part to check, which can be simplified to the following form. And it is supposed to be zero according to seven, expression seven uh, of the textbook. So what is our strategy? If we could uh, show, if we could demonstrate that any given pi for any given plan pi, uh, this limit holds, then it would mean that Every plan is in the restricted set of plans, so and and we would be we would be done because uh, all the plans would be in the restricted set uh, of of plans, and in this set we have the optimum plan. Uh, another uh, route to show that uh, the optimum plan dominates any other plan is to show that any other plan has the value of minus infinity. So let's try to show that any other plan other than the optimum plan uh, according to the optimum policy function. So let's try to show that any other plan other than the optimum policy function has the value of minus infinity. So, um, Let's release uh, expression 7. So let's say that 7 doesn't hold. Um, 
if we do so, then we have those brands which are in pi. So suspending seven, seven, I mean, leads to plans in pi, but not in the restricted set uh, of plans. At the same time, we released seven, but four, three and four still hold. Uh, ho four is, uh, this is just a reminder, This is a limit for uh, the return function. Okay. Um, and where the, the value of the plan is uh, the discounted sum of these one period return function, which must also have an upper bound. Formally put, from four, from four, it follows that this inequality for the value of the whole plan holds. Unexpected value, of course. Uh, if seven doesn't hold, then uh, the right-hand side of this expression must be must diverge, but uh, both four and three hold. So uh, if once again, if seven doesn't hold, the right-hand side uh, diverges and by using three, which still holds, you will see the point very soon, I promise. So please realize that, uh, oh, sorry. So three defines an upper bound for this part of the expression. So if seven doesn't hold, then the right-hand side of this expression is divergent, but at the same time, because of three, there is an upper bound. So there is an upper bound and the right, for the right-hand side, and the right-hand side uh, is divergent. So uh, there is only one possibility that any plan with an upper, so plans have upper bounds and divergent, the value is, is divergent. So any plan other than the optimum plan must have the value of minus infinity. And as the um, optimum plan uh, has a finite value, this must be optimal and dominates any other plan because they have uh, values of minus infinity. So condition B of CRM 9.12 also holds. That's all. It's... It's, it was tough. Approaching the end of 
to this lecture, let's have a few words about uh, stochastic Euler equations. In one sense, in one way, these stochastic uh, Euler equations are very useful and they are used very often, but in another sense, their use is uh, limited. So, uh, if we have a stochastic Bellman equation, it's easy to have the first order condition, which leads to a stochastic Euler equation, which, which is practically a second order difference equation. It's very useful because an optimum policy must satisfy the Euler equation. So given that we have uh, uh, restrictions, including the transversality condition, uh, if we introduce uh, expectations, uh, such a, a stochastic Euler equation can be used to find uh, the optimum policy. In another sense, uh, the use of stochastic Euler equations uh, is limited. If you remember, in chapter 6, we extensively used uh, deterministic Euler equations to linear, linearize dynamics around the steady state. So the idea was simple. Uh, we rewrote the system in, a, in a difference from the steady state um, the, with the idea that this linearized, dy linearized dynamics can help us to, to figure out whether steady state is stable or not. Um, the basic requirement to do so was to find a steady state. Uh, and in, determinist, in the deterministic case, the steady state was stable, if it was stable, so uh, it was a point uh, around which we could, uh, we could study linearized dynamics, but in the stochastic case, the steady state is not a stable point. Uh, the steady state of a system is a stochastic event. So, so in this sense, the Euler equations cannot be used to, to study linearized dynamics around the steady state because uh, in stochastic case, uh, how shall I put it? We are, we are shooting at a moving target. So the steady state of the system is moving under the effect of the stochastic noise. So we, we, cannot, we cannot use the Euler equation. Uh, uh, we cannot use the Euler equations to study linearized dynamics because the steady state is, is not steady in the sense uh, as it was steady in the deterministic case. The last topic for the day is the connection between policy functions and transition functions. Uh, how can we use the policy functions to have uh, to describe uh, transition functions? Suppose we have the usual Bauman equation, and suppose we have the solution, so we have the optimum uh, policy function. Um, what we are looking for is uh, is, the, is is a, is a transition function that describe the dynamics of the state as a whole, including the endogenous state and the exogenous state. Uh, note that the exogenous state is exogenous, so it, it, it walks its own way. Uh, it has uh, the transition function Q, uh, so the probabilities are described. And the, the agent responds to the exogenous shock through the policy function. So the idea is simple. Uh, with the use of the transition function and the policy function, uh, maybe we can find a way to describe the dynamics of the whole state. So let's, let's look into uh, this idea. What we are looking for is a transition function, P, which is a two-variable transition function. It describes the probability that the endo given x, the endogenous state next period falls into set A, and given z, the exogenous state next period falls into set B. Uh, we need to realize an interesting fact, which is not necessarily obvious. Uh, 
uh, given x and z, the event that uh, the endogenous state next period falls into set A, it is not a stochastic event. Given the policy function uh, to any given x and z, the policy function gives an exact value for the endogenous state next period. It falls into set A or it doesn't. So the event that the state next period falls into the rectangle A times B, this event, the pro this probability, the probability of this event is dependent only on the probability that the exogenous state next period falls into set B, if uh, the endogenous state next period falls into set A. So transition function T can be traced back to the transition function of the exogenous state if the endogenous state next period falls into set A, and probability zero otherwise. This is the idea that exercise 9.15 uh, utilizes. Uh, given the straightforward idea that with given x and z, the change in the endogenous state is not a stochastic event, uh, if we want to calculate the expected value of a function f with integrating with respect to the probability measure of t, this expected value can be reduced to calculating the expected value with respect to probability measure q. Uh, and on this ground, it is also easy to realize that if q has the failure property, t also has the failure property. There is one final thing to cover today, and uh, this is the possibility uh, to have a transition function for the endogenous state, for the endogenous state only. Um, what we are looking for is a transition function Q that describes the probability that given x, the endogenous state this period, x endogenous state uh, next period falls into set A. This is a usual transition function. Note that we have the policy function G, uh, and this policy function has an inverse, which is a uh, function gamma, and gamma uh, gives uh, x and z values, sets, a set to any given A uh, to which uh, the policy function uh, gives uh, an endogenous state next period that falls into set A. So if we have a set A, the inverse of the policy function uh, gives us those x and z values to which uh, the policy uh, the endogenous state next period falls into set A. So to any given A, we have uh, an x, z set in the plane. With given x, the whole thing is simpler because uh, to any given x, what we need is the x section of the set uh, that the uh, inverse of the policy function gave us. So we have those z values to which to the given x value, the policy function uh, gives uh, endogenous state next period falling into set A. So, uh, simplified, uh, simply put, uh, we can say that to any given x, uh, the probability that the endogenous state next period falls into set A is dependent on the probability that we have the appropriate z values. So, we need the x section of the inverse of the of the set that uh, is given by the inverse of the policy function g and we need the probability measure that uh, describes the probability uh, of uh, the appropriate z values next period so by the use of the policy function and the inverse of the policy function and the probability measure uh, of the 
um, exogenous state, we can have uh, the transition function for the endogenous state by the use of theorem 8.9.